Uh, Paul DiGiacomo, uh, who is uh, the, the head of global investment banking, one of three uh, managing partners of BDA Partners, one of the leading investment banks in Asia, to join us today to really speak about uh, Vietnam's place in the world and really kind of give perspective on where Vietnam's headed. Uh, he's been responsible for Asia and lived in Asia for over 25 years and in Vietnam for the last 10, and I hope I got most of that right. All right. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Morning. Um, I'm grateful to have a New Yorker introduce me because not many other people can pronounce my last name correctly in Asia. Um, happy to be here this morning. Uh, when Andy asked me uh, to do this initially, or, or, you might look at me and wonder why I'm giving a, a keynote on, on Vietnam, which is a fair observation. Uh, I think Andy's thought process was uh, I can provide a bit of regional perspective on Vietnam. I spent a lot of time here. Um, but I also spent a lot of time in Japan, China, Korea, uh, Southeast Asia. So I'm going to try to put Vietnam in at least my context. And that's what we'll talk about. I'll try to leave some time for questions. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, just briefly tell you a little bit about my, myself. As Eric mentioned, I've been an investment banker in Asia uh, for the last 25 years. Um, I have been, throughout that career, I've been active from India through to Japan. I've worked on transactions in most markets. Uh, I currently oversee our, our Asian business. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that on, on the next slide. Um, on a personal level, I've, I've lived in uh, Asia for 25 years. 15 of those were in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, and about 10 years ago, I decided that I really wanted to live in Ho Chi Minh City. And that was, to be candid, for personal reasons more so than business reasons, because I kept a regional role. Um, and when I did it, and even when I run around Asia and meet uh, clients across the region, I sometimes get a, a side eye. As they don't often meet regional investment bankers who've decided to base themselves in Vietnam. Uh, but it's been a good decision for me, and I'm beginning to feel a little bit validated in my choice as I see Ho Chi Minh climbing up the rankings of uh, livability. Um, Don and, and, and Brooke and Andy and others who've been here a long time, I think will we'll attest that it's not a bad place to spend time. Um, so my firm, BDA, uh, is an investment banking boutique. We're very focused on Asia. We've got uh, about 150 bankers across the region. Uh, and as an institution, we're very bullish on Vietnam. I'll, I think in large part, this presentation will be uh, twofold, explaining or demonstrating our bullishness and then articulating the reasons why we feel so confident about the market. Um, we've, been in, we've been in the market since 07 with our first investment banking mandate, a very small private equity sell side. Um, we continue to do business in the region, uh, opening a rep office in, in 2011. Uh, this is our footprint across Asia. You'll, you'll notice we're present in most major financial centers. Um, uh, and to some extent, Ho Chi Minh City is an outlier uh, alongside Shanghai, New York, uh, Tokyo. Um, I think that's a demonstration of our commitment and our view on the market. Uh, the fact that we have 10 full-time bankers on the ground here is a little bit atypical for, for regional investment banks. Vietnam's also the only market in which we invest our own capital in a structured way. So we have a partners fund uh, which deploys into really early stage uh, investments, seed capital type. Um, uh, we only do that in Vietnam, uh, I think for two reasons. That's what the partners decided. One, we feel we've got an, um, uh, a differentiated ability to assess opportunities because of our long-term presence in the market, but also because we really like the, we really like the market. We're, as I say, we're quite bullish on it. Uh, on the advisory side, um, we've maintained a very active advisory business, uh, working for, for large multinationals, Vietnamese company, uh, Vena Capital sometimes, um, small and growing Vietnamese companies, uh, and a lot of... Um, sophisticated uh, private equity and institutional investors. So uh, that, I just want to give you some background on, 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 on me and where I'm coming from so you can understand, maybe so, un start to understand my bullishness. Uh, begs the question, why are we so optimistic? Why are we so bullish on, on Vietnam? Uh, and really it's a story of uh, fundamentals and current environments. So there's, there's a set of really attractive uh, fundamental conditions 
uh, about Vietnam, which I'll talk about in, in some more depth, uh, and pair that with some uh, very highly favorable current dynamics, geopolitical and otherwise, um, which I'll also talk on. But let's talk about fundamentals first. Uh, the first being uh, demographics. Vietnam is a large and young country. It's nearly 100 million people. It still has decades left um, to benefit from the demographic dividend, whereby consumption will be increasing as a large cohort of Vietnamese consumers come into their prime consumption years. We have very low urbanization rates. Uh, our urbanization rates in Vietnam are the lowest in Southeast Asia. Uh, and for perspective, there are about 30 percentage points behind China. China's urbanization rates at about 70%. I think we're at 39%. But we're growing. Uh, our urbanization is increasing at the fastest rate uh, of any Southeast Asian country. Um, again, so this provides a decades-long uh, tailwind to growth in domestic consumption as people move from the country into the cities. Uh, a final point, uh, you know, we have a large and, and beneficial, we, uh, Vietnam has a large and beneficial global diaspora. We don't often talk about the Vietnamese diaspora in the same way that we might the Indian diaspora, um, but five million is not trivial. Uh, they're concentrated in developed uh, high GDP per cap countries like the US, Europe, and Australia. Uh, in the early years after reopening, uh, that diaspora brought pretty tangible benefits into Vietnam, uh, form of capital, know-how of, of the diaspora moving back, which was, uh, I think, very valuable in the early stage of development. Those factors are less necessary now, but still the international connectivity uh, that the, the diaspora provides uh, isn't trivial, and I think underpins some of what's attractive about Vietnam. Uh, the second point is a cultural one, um, and, and when I say that, I, what I mean is Vietnam, I see Vietnam as much more of an East Asian country and culture than a Southeast Asian one. Uh, and what I mean by that is simply that, uh, on balance, it has more in common culturally with China, Taiwan, Korea, and even Japan uh, than it does with other Southeast Asian nations like Thailand, Indonesia, or the Philippines. Uh, and that commonality is, is underpinned by a few things. Uh, there's a shared value system, right? There's a common thread of Confucianism running through all these countries. Uh, and to be honest, that probably explains most of the cultural similarity. That Confucian thread running through is thousands of years old uh, and as an as a organizing philosophy is quite pervasive across family, work, uh, social uh, interactions. Um, so I, again, I think that explains a lot of it. Uh, but there are two other things I, I'd highlight. Second would be education. There's a great focus on education in these East Asian countries. Um, and my favorite illustration of that point uh, is, is, a, is a stat. So Vietnam has more college students studying in the US than all but four countries. And those four are China, India, Korea, and Canada. Uh, and I'm always surprised when I see that stat because that that's really Vietnam punching above its weight, in my view. Um, the next country on that list is Taiwan. So you can see there's a, there's a strong East Asian representation in going to the US trying to attend the best colleges. Uh, and the third point I'd make is, um, or the third, uh, I think, shared similarity across the East Asian countries is an entrepreneurial drive. Um, so all of these countries have had a long history, private business ownership, capitalism. Um, but conversely, at the start of their uh, rapid, uh, accelerate, rapid um, development boom, um, to some extent, they're all first in a first generation of entrepreneurship. So China, after reopening in 79, 80, is the most obvious example. Long history in China of business, um, but through the communist period, it had been suppressed. And when, uh, and when it was opened in 79, um, you had a first generation of entrepreneurs. And I think that drove uh, an, eco an economic boom and, and, uh, and an up cycle. And I think Vietnam seems to share some of those similarities. Uh, these points aren't on, on culture. Um, it's not just academic, right? Because the reason I spent time on it is I think it, it really underpins uh, Vietnam's ability to develop uh, the East Asian development model, which I'll talk about uh, in a slide or two. Third point uh, is stability. 
Um, Vietnam has been politically and socially stable for a relatively long time. It doesn't often get credit for that, um, both in the West, which tends to look at things solely through a lens of democracy, but it also doesn't get credit necessarily in the region. Um, again, my favorite illustration of this is an anecdote. Remember years ago, I was talking to one of my Thai clients uh, about the opportunity to buy a business in, in Vietnam. That was a great fit for them, uh, great terms. And ultimately, they declined to proceed, per, uh, uh, proceed on the investment. Uh, and the reason that they cited was they were concerned about political risk in Vietnam. And the timing was delicious, because the same week they're telling me this, literally, there was a coup in, a coup in Thailand, army and tanks on the street in Bangkok, and they're worried about political stability in Vietnam. Now, that, that's 10 years ago. I think since then, Thai companies have realized that coming into Vietnam actually is uh, very acceptable from a political risk perspective, and we've done a lot with Thai companies to come in. Um, political stability is a reality, though. Uh, there aren't coups. Uh, there aren't contentious con contests uh, over who wields power. Of course, there's competition uh, for power, but it's not all encompassing. Uh, it's not all encompassing event for the country every four years. Nor does it produce policy whiplash every time there's a, there's a slight change of control, uh, and that's really important. Uh, policy stability gives foreign investors confidence to come in and make long-term investments in the country, uh, and maybe outside renewables. Vietnam has been very good at policy stability. Um, Fourth point, uh, Vietnam has been socio-economically stable as well. You know, there aren't significant internal frictions between different ethno-religious groups, nor is there a massive disagreement on the direction in which the country is moving. That's very important. Uh, and finally, I find Vietnam to be a very optimistic country. Uh, it's regu regularly topping rankings of populations with a most positive view on, on the outlook for the medium term. I observe this same phenomenon in China around WTO accession in 2003. Um, and I thought then, and I still think now, that a broadly shared belief uh, among a population that tomorrow is going to be better is a pretty powerful enabler of economic development. And I think Vietnam has that uh, to its benefit at the moment. Uh, and the fourth point, which I've alluded to a couple times, uh, is the East Asian development model, which is just a long-winded name for uh, describing the climb up the economic ladder from production of low value products uh, and exports to much higher value added and differentiated <laughs> products. Along the way of that journey, uh, an industrial base develops, supply chain, skilled labor force, supporting infrastructure and services, uh, and then IP follows as well. Uh, Japan famously did it after World War II. Um, uh, uh, Taiwan and Korea did it in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and, and China most recently did it, um, starting from opening, but really accelerating from 2000, the early 2000s when they joined WTO. Uh, Vietnam's very clearly following along that same path that these East Asian countries have done. Um, and as a result, Vietnam's going to have the, the most interesting uh, and advanced manufacturing economy in Southeast Asia very soon, if it doesn't already, and it may already. And so when we look at FDI numbers, uh, Don alluded to it earlier. I'm sure Michael will talk about it in more depth. But the growth that we see in FDI um, through COVID and during the post-COVID period is a pretty clear indication to me of this East Asian development model coming through. So you've had good growth in FDI, um, but also the type of, of foreign direct investment that's coming through is much different than you would have seen years ago. You've got Lego putting a billion dollars into a fairly advanced manufacturing facility. Uh, Samsung's made Northern Vietnam their most important manufacturing hub outside of Korea. LG's following suit for their own products and production for, for Apple. Uh, and most recently, you've got a ton of positive noise um, from the semicon sector about beginning to evaluate Vietnam as a really uh, attractive place to do business. Intel's been here for a long time on the, the lowest value added side of it, the, the back end, but you're starting to see a lot more of the front end, middle end. Uh, semicon players begin to look at Vietnam as diversification away from China and diversification away from Taiwan. Um, so we're already seeing that shift in the development curve to the right. So those are the fundamentals. Um, uh, there's some 
as I alluded to at the beginning, there's some very helpful tailwinds um, that are uh, at Vietnam's back for the moment. And very simply, it's the, the US-China tension, right? It, it, everything that's good in happening in Vietnam is currently being accelerated by the US-China decoupling and the, the global rethinking of supply chains as a result. You know, I think we're all aware of the speed at which the US and China are disentangling from each other. And I, I know that speakers after me will, will delve into this in great detail, so I don't want to spend that much time on the geopolitics of, of what's happening right now. Um, but to me, the upside is, is, is massive, clear, uh, and it's already beginning to be realized in a way that's greatly to Vietnam's benefit. Um, when I started to talk to Eric uh, about this uh, a month or two ago and began to frame my thoughts for this talk, he made a passing comment about a potential upgrade from uh, frontier status to emerging market status. Uh, and it gave me pause uh, because I've spent all my life in private markets, not in public markets. I work with large private equity investors, large sovereign wealth funds. And in private markets, I would argue that Vietnam has been an emerging market for a long, long time. Uh, and so I know that you know, we, we talk about an upgrade, but to some extent, when you see people like TPG and KKR and, and Warburg uh, and Bain you know, putting billions of dollars into Vietnam, to me, is, is a pretty strong indication about the investability of, of the market. Um, you know, this is the, the smartest capital that's, uh, that's making a, a, a pretty committed bet to, to Vietnam. The most recent was, I think, uh, announced yesterday, where Bain uh, decided, uh, agreed to put 200 million into Masan. So mostly, I've so far, I've talked about uh, big picture, long-term issues. Um, but I'd also like to take the chance to give you a, some perspective on what's happening now in the market. And for me, it's going to be a qualitative perspective because I'm not an economist and uh, I know concepts better than numbers. And I think Michael will follow me with a lot more insight about what's actually happening now in the economy. But I thought what could be interesting is to just give a snapshot of what our clients are telling us. So we took an informal survey of, I think, about 12 of our clients uh, with a really pointed question was, how does the market look now? Have you bottomed? Uh, and if not, what's your perspective on uh, what 24 looks like versus 23? There's, some, there's six snapshots here, but actually we talked to more, and I'll try to summarize by sector. Some of it was surprising. So the exporters told me um, that they thought they were off the bottom already. Uh, and these are companies that are making in Vietnam for export to the US, uh, think food, footwear, garments, furniture. They had a terrible last 9, 12 months, but think as of today, the next 12 months are much better. Uh, I think a lot of the reason for that is that their US customers have worked through the excess inventory and back to a normal. So the, the glut's been worked out of the supply chain, uh, and it's back to they're able to serve the US demand. That was a surprise to me, but a very pleasant one. Um, Conversely, consumer companies are still generally telling me that they see weakness in, in their business. Uh, discretionary spend, consumers are a bit cautious on discretionary spend. Um, they're expecting the first half of 24 to be when they see a rebound uh, in consumer demand. Um, the healthcare businesses that we work with, which tends to be more focused on healthcare services, I haven't seen much of a slowdown uh, in demand and still feel pretty good about things. And these are clinics and, and hospitals and other healthcare services. Um, they, have, they seem to be uh, more immune from the discretionary spend caution. Uh, and the final one I'll highlight is, is education, because I think it's an interesting segmentation of, of the market. Um, at the high end, you have the international schools, which are charging uh, in excess of $25,000 a year in tuition. Uh, they've done well. All right? Their tuitions are up. Uh, they were able to push through. Uh, eight to 10% tuition increases starting this year. Uh, they're not really complaining. Their student base is typically, there's a large amount of corporate pay, uh, expatriates coming into Vietnam or the companies funding education, and you know the top 1% of Vietnamese families who also haven't done that badly over the last 12 months and really aren't that price sensitive to, for education. Um, similarly, at the lower end, and these are schools I would define as $5,000 and below annual tuition, they've also been doing well. 
uh, their, their current enrollments for the year starting August 23, uh, were good. Um, and were reasonably good during COVID as well. Um, and it's not because the, the, the segment of the population that they're serving uh, is, is doing exceptionally well. It's that they're benefiting from a trade down from the middle. The middle being schools in the five to $15,000 a year uh, tuition um, have lost a lot of, uh, have lost a lot of their students to the lower end because they're, 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 the parents aren't yet comfortable to make a 10, 12 year commitment to a 10 or $15,000 a year spend. They're hopeful that, that beginning next year they'll begin to resume their um, uh, their growth in tuition, or their growth in enrollments. So I, I've talked a fair bit about what I think is good about Vietnam, or what I think is really attractive, but I, I, I shouldn't pretend that there's no risk to the base case that Vietnam's gonna have a great next decade or two. Uh, so there's three things that, that, um, that, I, that, I, that I worry about. Uh, and one of them is not the current, uh, the current real estate issue, which I think is nowhere near what's happening in China. Um, and to me, it looks more like a, a normal consolidation after a, a bunch of boom years. But the three things that worry me are climate change. Um, Vietnam's at a higher than average risk from rising sea levels. Addressing that requires collective action across the globe, um, which doesn't appear to be happening. And the defense against rising sea levels is likely to be expensive and, and frankly, untested. So I ask myself, can we, can we keep the water out of the delta? Uh, and out of the coastal cities, uh, and I don't know. It, it, it's a big what if, and I, I, I wrestle with it both personally. Um, I wonder if my house is gonna be underwater in 10 years, uh, but also professionally about what it means. Uh, this is the one I worry about the most, but it's also the, the most um, uh, distant, uh, the distant one. Uh, a second risk is, is maybe a bit more theoretical, the rollback of, of globalization. We've talked about the benefits to Vietnam um, I think there's a risk that deglobalization continues in the U.S. Uh, goes really f too far the, the other way and brings a, home a lot of manufacturing. But to be honest, I think that's probably the least, um, the most unlikely of the three risks I'm talking about. Uh, and the third one would be infrastructure inf insufficiency. Um, you know, we're not nearly as good at China as rolling out infrastructure. We're probably better than India at rolling it out but there's still a meaningful risk that all kinds of infrastructure is not in place to meet the needs of rapid growth uh, and the needs of a much more advanced manufacturing economy. This is the most near-term issue, but it's also the issue that's most within Vietnam's control to address. Right? There's no external forces really at play here about whether Vietnam delivers on infrastructure or not. So that can give me hope. Uh, and notwithstanding the risks and notwithstanding you know, some of the, the, the bumpiness and discretionary consumer spend, uh, to me, the outlook is, is very bright. And I will summarize that by giving a snapshot of what I think we might have in 2030. Uh, we'll have a large middle class. 36 million people is, is quite a large middle class. Uh, and it's going to be fairly well distributed across the country. Of course, a lot of that's going to be concentrated in, in Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi. Um, but there's going to be, per forecast, um, 25 cities in Vietnam with more than a quarter of a million mass and affluent consumers. And that kind of distributed, uh, distributed wealth and distributed um, middle class, I think, is a very good economic driver from that point forward. Third. Um, will have a really meaningful place in the global supply chain for advanced manufacturing, especially in electronics and, and semiconductors. Uh, and if you look at any country that's done that previously, uh, it's been a great, great development story once they get that advanced manufacturing base. And finally, we might even have a subway line, if we're lucky. Um, so that's my views. I thank you for indulging me. I think I've left a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, otherwise, thanks for, for listening.
but the question is, uh, what happens between the world now and how it's going to get Well, um, I think Michael's going to talk about the, the benefits of what's been happening from the U.S. perspective. I think that'll drive a lot of it, but to me, that, that's what... Some of the, the, the drivers are almost automatic. There's, there's such a strong push for, for foreign companies to come into the market for, for geopolitical reasons and for underlying attractiveness of, of, of Vietnam. I don't think that we have to do a lot actively, or I don't think Vietnam has to do a lot actively to, to, um, uh, to draw in the interest uh, it needs to deliver on policy and it needs to deliver on infrastructure to make it uh, a hospitable place for that investment. I think that's the most important. A million people, I reckon. Uh, I'll talk more about the poor folks uh, later today, but uh, how would you break down the other two groups in terms of millions, uh, the, the wealthier group and the not so wealthy group? Uh, the, well, the wealthier group's obviously a minority, so it's um, uh, five million. Upper end of the affluent and the, you know, the, I don't know how the, the bottom breaks out between non-middle class or aspiring middle class and, and poor. Um, it's a fair question. You might know better than I do. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.